God has called us to this place and made of us a body in his name, indeed the body of Christ. Let us stand together and join in the call to worship. Come, let us worship and bow down. Let us for he is our God. Come, let us worship and bow down. Scripture tells us that all have sinned and fallen short of God's glory. If we believe ourselves to be sinless, we are self-deceived and strangers to the truth. If we confess our sin, God is just and may be trusted to forgive us of every kind of wrong. Let us then, in faith and hope, confess our sins together. Late have I loved you, O beauty so ancient and so new. Late have I loved you. You were within me, but I was outside, and it was there that I searched for you. In my unloveliness, I plunged into the lovely things which you created. You were with me, but I was not with you. Created things kept me from you. Yet if they had not been in you, they would not have been at all. You called, you shouted, and you broke through my deafness. You flashed, you shone, and you dispelled my blindness. You breathed your greatness on me. I drew in breath, and now I pant for you. I have tasted you. Now I hunger and thirst for more. You touched me, and I burned for your peace. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Friends, hear the good news. This statement is sure and completely reliable. In, in, Christ came into the world to rescue sinners through his personal sacrifice 
We all have been made dead to sin and alive to all that is good. Friends, believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. To prepare our hearts for the hearing of God's word, let us pray. Gracious God, we do not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from your mouth. Make us hungry for this heavenly food, that it may nourish us today in the ways of eternal life. Through Jesus Christ, the bread of heaven. Amen. I listen now to the reading from Romans 12, 9 to 21, it's on page 923 in your Bible. Let love be genuine, hate what is evil, hold fast to what is good, love one another with mutual affection, outdo one another in showing honor, do not lag in zeal, be, at, be ardent in spirit, serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope, be patient in suffering, persevere in prayer, contribute to the needs of the saints, extend hospitality to strangers, bless those who persecute you, bless and do not curse them, rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep, live in harmony with one another, do not be haughty but associate with the lowly. Do not claim to be wiser than you are. Do not repay anyone evil for evil, but take thought for what is noble in the sight of all. If it is possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave room for the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. No, if your enemies are hungry, feed them. If they are thirsty, give them something to drink. For by doing this, you will heap burning coals on their heads. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. The word of the Lord. Oh, 
Thank you, Matt. I'd now like to invite all the children forward for a conversation. Come on down. We have plenty of space here on the steps. You win the award for being the first one down. We've got a good group of people here. Look at you. Hayden, how you doing? I dig those boots. You need to get me some like that. Go, Grayson. Hey, Peyton, hadn't seen you in a while. Come on down. Well, I'm going to reach back here real quick because I need to flip a switch. No, this is a burning bush. Can't you tell? <laughs> it's a raging, burning fire. Earlier, I was asked why I wasn't wearing my robe today, and my first answer was, you know, it's summer and it's still pretty hot and it gets hot under that robe, but the second is I knew I was going to be next to this raging, burning bush. You see it? Feel the heat? 
No. But let's pretend. It's not really a burning bush, but let's pretend. Let's pretend that these are flames and they're, they're raging because we're going to talk a little bit about a story about Moses. We're going to be using him in our sermon today. And do any of you remember the story of Moses? Have you heard it before? Moses was a great man. And Oh, it's for Pastor Cynthia. I will make sure she gets that. Thank you very much. And Moses was a great character in our, in our Bible, and it's important for us to learn about him. And he did many great things. He saved his people from slavery in Egypt. And do any of you remember about the plagues? There were frogs, there were locusts. He parted a sea so that they could walk through it. Moses did a lot of great things. But before all of that happened, God had to call Moses and tell him that he had something for him to do. And how did he do that? With a burning bush. Believe it or not, it's pretty extraordinary. Moses was out in the fields tending to a flock of sheep. He was a shepherd at the time. And then he saw this burning bush. But what was amazing about it is it wasn't burning up. It was on fire, but it wasn't being consumed. It wasn't going away. It wasn't turning to ash. It was just on fire. And he was amazed by it. Wouldn't you be pretty amazed if you saw something on fire and it wasn't burning up? Wouldn't that catch your attention if you saw a big raging fire? So he went to the bush, seeing that something's going on here, and God spoke to him and said, Moses, I'm calling you to save my people. And you know what Moses' reaction was? Do you think he said, sure, I'll go? Was that his answer? No, it wasn't. Moses said, why don't you send somebody else? And he started coming up with all these excuses. Why? Because Moses didn't think he was good enough. He didn't think he was powerful enough, that he was a great speaker. He didn't think he was worthy to do it. Have you ever felt like that before, that you've been asked to do something and you're like, ah, I can't do that, that's too much. Have you ever been asked that? Sometimes it can feel too much. And Moses felt that way, but God said, no, I am calling you. Sometimes we feel like we aren't big enough, we aren't strong enough, maybe we don't feel we're smart enough, fast enough to do good works for God. But I'm here to tell you that it doesn't matter how old you are, it doesn't matter how fast you are, it doesn't matter how strong you are, look at me, I'm not that strong, am I? But God can use you to do really good things. You can be good to your classmates. You can be excited to tell them about Jesus. You can listen to your parents. You can participate here at church. We have lots of wonderful things going on for all ages. You can sing. You can learn. You can participate and worship and come and join us just like you're doing now for God because you are big enough. You are good enough. You are strong enough fast enough to do what God has called you to do. So don't ever forget that. Don't let anybody ever tell you when God has told you to do something that you're too small because you're not. So can we pray together? Will you pray with me? Let's pray. Dear God, thank you for calling us to do your work and that we are not too small to do anything you've called us to do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, thank you guys. You can have your seat. We'll see you later. And Pastor Cynthia, your gift. I'd say it's a pretty good sign when you're receiving gifts already. So that's... Things have, must have gone well while I was away. As I mentioned to the children, our passage this morning is perhaps a familiar one, maybe, maybe not, uh, to you about Moses. And it's his call from God. And often we remember this passage as the passage about the burning bush. And so I'd like to invite you to follow along. You can turn in your pew Bible to page 44. And we'll look at Exodus chapter 3, the first 15 verses. So let's listen to the word of the Lord. Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian. 
He led his flock beyond the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of a bush. He looked and the bush was blazing, yet was not consumed. Then Moses said, I must turn aside and look at this great sight and see why the bush is not burned up. When the Lord saw that he had turned aside to see, God called to him out of the bush, Moses, Moses, he said, here I am. Then he said, come no closer, remove the sandals from your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. He said further, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, and Moses hid his face for he was afraid to look at God. Then the Lord said, I have observed the misery of my people who are in Egypt. I have heard their cry on account of their taskmasters. Indeed, I know their sufferings, and I have come down to deliver them from the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey, to to the country of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. The cry of the Israelites has now come to me. I have also seen how the Egyptians oppressed them. So come, I will send you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? He said, I will be with you, and this shall be the sign that it is I who sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall worship God on this mountain. But Moses said to God, If I come to the Israelites and say to them, The God of your ancestors has sent me to you, and they ask me, What is his name? What shall I say to them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. He said further, Thus you shall say to the Israelites, I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, Thus you shall say to the Israelites, The Lord, the God of your ancestors, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and this my title for all generations. Go and assemble the elders of Israel and say to them, The Lord, the God of your ancestors, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, has appeared to me, saying, I have given heed to you and to what has been done to you in Egypt. I declare that I will bring you up out of the misery of Egypt to the land of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites, a land flowing with milk and honey. They will listen to your voice And you and the elders of Israel shall go to the king of Egypt and say to him, The Lord, the God of the Hebrews, has met with us. Let us now go a three days journey into the wilderness so that we may sacrifice to the Lord our God. I know, however, that the king of Egypt will not let you go unless compelled by a mighty hand. So I will stretch out my hand and strike Egypt with all my wonders that I will perform in it. After that, He will let you go. I will bring this people into your favor with the Egyptians, that when you go, you will not go empty-handed. Brothers and sisters, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Almighty God, we do thank you for your word to us through the stories of Scripture that remind us of our story. And we pray that as we ponder your words, that you would silence any voice in us but your own. And Lord, I pray that as my words stray from yours, may they fall away and quickly be forgotten. But may your word, your truth, and your promise remain upon our hearts forevermore. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. How many of you remember the story of Moses from growing up in church, perhaps? Anybody here? You can raise your hands. I won't call upon you. It's a wonderful story, and if you grew up in church, you heard it from an early age. Perhaps 
Like me, you even remember coloring pictures of the burning bush, whether it be in Sunday school or sitting in the pew while listening to the pastor preach on that passage. And perhaps like me, you remember epic stories about Moses. Perhaps, how many of you remember the Ten Commandments with Charlton Heston? Anybody else here remember that? I cannot read Exodus and hear Moses speak in Scripture without hearing Charlton Heston's voice when he says, Let my people go! Or for the younger ones here, perhaps you remember there was an animated film, The Prince of Egypt. It's a wonderful story, an amazing story, and as amazing as those movies are at recreating the story, they all still seem to fall short to capture the wonder of this man named Moses and the God who would call him. And so we find ourselves this morning standing before this burning bush and this wonderful story, but to truly understand the impact that this call from God had upon Moses, we have to dial back a little bit to remember where Moses came from. Moses was a Hebrew. He was an Israelite, abandoned by his family in hopes of his safety, adopted by Pharaoh's daughter, raised in the courts of Pharaoh. And then one day he was out and saw the taskmasters abusing the Israelites. And saw in one instant, one was being whipped, and he was so moved to intervene that he intervened and wind up murdering the taskmaster. And so he fled, fearing the repercussions of that murder. And here we find him this morning, put out to pasture with his father-in-law's flock. This once prince of Egypt, so to speak, is now a shepherd in the field. And he happens upon a raging, burning bush. Remember, use your imagination. Raging, burning bush. And God speaks to him. Perhaps you, like me, when you read the story, sense that Moses is, seems to be pretty content to be where he is. He's happy. He's started his, a new family in Exodus, out in the fields. He's tending sheep for his father-in-law, Life is okay. Life is peaceful. We'll stay right here. But God has other plans for Moses and decides to meet Moses exactly where he is through a burning bush. Amy Merrill Willis from Lynchburg College says this. She says, God, when we say that God meets us where we are, the implication is that we are not always where we should be, but that God adapts and accommodates us nonetheless. Isn't that interesting? When we say that God meets us where we are, the implication is that we are not always where we should be, but that God adopts, adapts and accommodates us nonetheless. God comes down, is what the scripture says, to intervene on behalf of God's people. God comes down and meets Moses where he is to call him out of that place where he was. Willis goes on to point out that reluctance that we sense in Moses is a common thread when we hear about prophets being commissioned or called. Often there is reluctance, but Moses must be the most reluctant of them all. For when we read through chapter 3 and chapter 4, we see that Moses not only objects once, but he objects on four different occasions. Four different occasions. Verse 11, verse 13, and then in chapter 4, verses 1 and 10. And all of this before he says in verse 13 of chapter 4, send someone else, God. Surely there's someone more qualified than I. Send someone else. His first objection, actually the first two objections, are all about identity. The first one was his answer of, who am I? Who am I, God? Who am I that you would send me to the courts of Pharaoh? This question has a lot more to say about how Moses sees himself than God, does it not? 
He's saying, I'm not good enough. I'm not strong enough. I'm not eloquent enough. In fact, he mentions his speech in a later objection. I'm not eloquent enough to speak on behalf of God. Who am I? But God says, I'm sending you, and this will be the sign that you will lead my people out of Egypt. But Moses doesn't stop there. His second objection is about the identity of God. For in that, he says, If I come to the Israelites and say to them, The God of your ancestors has sent me to you, and they ask, What is his name? What shall we say to them? He's really asking, Who are you? Who are you that's sending me? And God answers as only God can answer. In the famous words, I am who I am. Or you could be translated, I am what I am, or I will be what I will be. In other words, we know God on God's terms, not our own. But God continues and says, Tell them the Lord, the God of your ancestors, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, has sent you to them. God is saying, I am known through my actions. And if you remember, if you remember, you will know who I am. Remember your ancestors. Remember your story. And so the point of this entire passage, of this entire narrative, really is about God's salvation. God comes down to save the people. God saves them through Moses. And so we must not forget that. God saves. But I think there's more that we can pull from this. If we go back to Moses, if we know, we know how the story ends, do we not? We know that Moses saves the people. Moses becomes the messenger to Pharaoh. Moses becomes the parter of the sea. Moses becomes the bearer of the commandments, the leader in the wilderness. But all before that, he was out to pasture with a flock of sheep, and God called him. Do you ever feel put out to pasture? You've heard this idiom before, have you not? Put out to pasture. We often use it to describe those who are retired because it's pulled from our understanding when horses, let's say, when they are uh, unable to work and do hard labor, then they are put to pasture to live the rest of their days in peace. And so we use it when we say we're retiring somebody that they've been put to pasture. Or I've been told that pastors never retire, they just go out to pastor. <laughs> I know, that's bad. You can strike that from your memories. But when we use this term put to pasture, it's, it often carries more of a negative connotation, does it not? It doesn't always feel good to be put to pasture. Do any of you feel put to pasture? Do you feel, perhaps it was well-intentioned people that put you there. Perhaps it was people who put you there and you feel there because they're looking out for your best interests. They want you to live a life of peace. Don't worry about all the stress. But perhaps you are out to pasture because of a self-imposed reason, like Moses. Perhaps things got too rough, too tough, and you just had to pull away. You needed peace. Perhaps you don't feel that you have anything useful to bring to the table. And so you're content to sit on the sidelines in the pasture. There are lots of different reasons that you might feel put to pasture. But this passage reminds us that God calls us from the pasture. God calls each and every one of us from the pasture. Earlier, Quentin read for us the passage in Romans where Paul is writing to the church in Rome about marks of being a believer, be, being a Christian. And there's a wonderful list of acts and things that we must do and be to be a Christian. If you're a Christian, this is how we act. This is who we are as individuals. And it was a wonderful list, and perhaps reading it, you can agree to those, right? Those are good things to do. But if you notice, reading through that, and if you have to read it again, read it again, there's something missing. 
What's missing? An expiration date. There is no expiration date to those marks of being a Christian. There is no time that we are no longer that. There is no expiration date. We are reminded in Scripture that it doesn't matter how old we might feel or we might be, that God still uses us. We remember Abraham and Sarah. In fact, Scripture tells us that Abraham was well advanced in his age, and yet God used Abraham and Sarah to bear a child to an unbarren woman at an old age to start a nation. But I'm also going to pick on those who might consider themselves younger here as well. Because if you read that list again, you'll notice there's no expiration date, but there's also no maturity date. There's no line that says, once you reach the age of 16 and get your license, then you start becoming a Christian. No. There is no begin, except when your life begins. There's no maturity date. There is no expiration date. And Scripture reminds us again, a story we hear about David, who is the youngest of his brothers, who is called out of the pasture of his father's field to be anointed the next king and conqueror of Goliath. And yet, he was the youngest of his brothers. We have all sorts of excuses. And maybe they're well-meaning excuses. I'm too old, I'm too young. I just, I'm just not quite as talented as I used to be. I don't have as much time. We, we can list them. We can make a whole list. But the truth is God calls us out of the pasture to the work that's happening around us. Too often, our church becomes a pasture. We are content to sit here with smiling faces while there's so much to be done around us. But the good news is God meets us where we are as individuals, as a church, as a society, and calls us in a magnificent way. So I want you to look at this bush and hear God's voice calling to you, calling you out. We have wonderful work to be done. Sure, throughout life, our abilities do change. And perhaps we can't always do things in the same way. That's our hope with children as they grow, that they are able to do more and more for themselves and more ability. As I watch my son, I see that he's being more articulate with his hands every single day. And one day he's going to be able to do wonderful things with those hands. But God continues to use each and every one of us. And we should never be content to be put to pasture. We should only be content when we are out doing the will of God. We have entered a new season in our ministry here at the church. We have a new senior pastor who's receiving gifts from children. We have a time to really look at ourselves and say, who are we? But far more important than that, who is God calling us to be? And I can tell you it's not going to be shepherds in the pasture. God is calling us to something more, something greater. God is calling us to participate in a larger story. One of my favorite quotes is, is that if we do not find our place in a larger story, we're content to find it in a smaller one. Our story is not a small, contained story. Our story is greater, and God calls us to a higher purpose. So my prayer is as we start to unveil and pray and discern what God is calling us to be and to do, that we would no longer be content to sit on the sidelines, that we would be called to go out and serve the God who is, the God who loves, the God who has always been. Let us pray. Holy God, we do thank you for being the God that calls us And we pray that you would speak clearly to us. Perhaps we need a burning bush or a neon sign. But perhaps we merely need silence and a time to listen as we work together to discern who you are calling us to be and what you're calling us to do as your church. 
May we have the courage to set aside our objections, to set our, aside our excuses, and to leave the pasture which we've placed ourselves or others have placed us to go out to do your good work. In Jesus' name we pray. And all the saints said, Amen. Would you please stand, if able, as we affirm our faith together with this simple question from the Westminster Confession. Brothers and sisters, what is the chief end of man? Man's chief end is to glorify God and to enjoy Him forever. may be seated. God has given us so much, and we are stewards of the kingdom of God here in our midst. So with gratitude, let us turn back to God with our tithes and our offerings. Would the ushers please come forward?
Holy Lord, creator of all that fills our lives with joy, the gifts we bring to you are tokens of our gratitude. From your gracious hand, we have received peace, grace, hope, and love. May the gifts we bring result in other hearts coming to know the joy of your love. Amen. now return to God in prayer as we lift up one another. This morning, I would like to invite you in a moment of silence to lift up to God those prayers upon your hearts for maybe friends or family, perhaps neighbors, perhaps those you have heard about, perhaps foreign nations, perhaps even people you might consider enemies. Let us lift up to God in prayer those individuals, and they will come together to pray our Lord's Prayer. Let us pray. Lord, silence to us can sometimes seem so awkward. We are used to constant sounds, to constant visuals, to constant activity, but yet you call us to quiet our hearts, still our minds, to quiet our souls, and to come before you. But how hard that is for us to do. Lord, we pray that you would hear those prayers that we lifted up to you in silence, that you would hear those prayers that we were perhaps even uncomfortable voicing, that you would hear those prayers that we can't even yet find words to express. We offer them to you and to your care, for you are a loving God who meets us where we are and calls us out to a greater purpose and take part in a far greater story. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Almighty God, we join our voices together as we so often do, praying that ancient prayer that you taught us by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
Peace of Christ be with you, Patrick. Peace also with you. Brothers and sisters, as you prepare to leave your pasture and go out to the work God has prepared for you, may God be in your head and in your understanding. May God be in your eyes and in your seeing. May God be in your ears and in your hearing. May God be in your mouth and in your speaking. May God be in your heart and in your knowing. May God be in your coming, but especially in your going. Go in peace. Amen. Amen.